All right, so uh, what time do we have here? We're going to kick it off. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, uh, leadership webinar that we hold every two or three weeks, depending on the information that's out there, usually concerning COVID, because we like to give you guys as much information as we can muster up with all the different counties in, in um, Washington, DC and Maryland. And um, just wanted to give you guys a little bit of information about today. This webinar is being recorded for those that can't make it during the day. And, and, and if they have the uh, urgency to listen to it again or later, it will be online. And uh, uh, that's number one. Number two, um, Please use, this is very important, please use your chat feature um, uh, for all questions and also leave your mute on because we don't want to hear background noise during uh, our, uh, you know, our discussions, especially when uh, Will is going to be speaking. And if you do want to speak and ask a respect, respectful question, please be respectful and announce yourself and your affiliation before you speak. So uh, with that being said, um, as you know and may not know that last week, you, the U.S. soccer had their AGM. We, we all participated through uh, Zoom or the webinar, and um, uh, it was very interesting. And uh, about a month ago, we chatted with the new uh, Federation CEO and Secretary General, Will Wilson, just to introduce our ourselves from Maryland and let them know who we are. And I asked him at that, at that time if he would consider uh, coming on for just a quick update and, and introduce himself to Maryland and to uh, DC. And he was kind enough. He said to us at the time that after the AGM, he would do it. And this is one week after the AGM. And he's, he gracefully came on, on board with us to introduce himself to you know, uh, answer maybe a few questions and kind of guide us and let us know what's happening with uh, the Federation. So um, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Will Wilson, Secretary General and CEO of U.S. Soccer. Well, thanks, Mark. That's quite an introduction. I appreciate it. I think, first of all, I would just like to congratulate everyone on this call for, I believe, the 45th year anniversary of Maryland Youth Soccer. So that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, and obviously a testament to all the hard work of, of everyone who's been on this call and been along for the journey. So congratulations to you all. Um, you know, it's been an interesting year for me, you know, joining uh, the Federation really right at the onset of the pandemic. Uh, you know, at that point in time, I was living in North Carolina. You know, we were chatting a little bit earlier, a few minutes ago, uh, how we have since moved to Chicago in October. Uh, but literally my entire uh, tenure so far has been in a you know, in a predominantly virtual environment, which uh, has been challenging on multiple fronts. I know you guys are all facing the same challenges in your own uh, work and personal lives, uh, but it's made it, uh, you know, an interesting journey. Uh, I think some of the things we've learned along the way or that we've been focused on along the way, uh, being in a pandemic were, you know, improvements that we've made in the U.S. Soccer Learning Center uh, in adapting our programming, if you will, uh, to more of a virtual uh, platform. And I think we've taken some of that learning and we're going to continue to use that as we go forward and come out of the pandemic, regardless, because we learned there are some efficiencies there and how we offer up our coaching and referee programs and educational resources. So that's been something that's been uh, an interesting uh, process for us over the course of this period of time. Uh, you know, we forged a partnership with the Aspen Institute Project Play. It's a multi-sport, multi-year effort to grow national sport participation. So we've taken some time to take a step back and think about that and how we can approach uh, the sport long-term, if you will, coming out of the pandemic. And then uh, we pivoted, as you guys know, our ITG uh, funds to go towards COVID relief and then have since uh, extended the window on the back of the AGM for, for those organizations that haven't uh, tried to participate or, or put in an application for it. So we're obviously cognizant of what's happening in our ecosystem and all the struggles that everyone is going through uh, relative to the, uh, the pandemic. I'd also say that we've been kind of, inter it's been an opportunity, I think, across the organization to be internally focused. Part of that is me being new and getting up to speed on, 
uh, you know, what we have and what's been going on and what some of our challenges have been, uh, but also departmentally. So, you know, I've made a couple of key hires uh, in this time frame, uh, namely our chief legal officer, Karen Alitso, who, who joined us probably three or four months ago, uh, and David Wright, our chief commercial officer, who's come in uh, as well. Uh, that's helped sort of build and solidify the leadership team, and that'll start to cascade down again as we start to evolve our organization. Uh, we've made a, a heavy commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion under Cindy's leadership uh, that we have uh, really pushed through at every level and want to engage with our partners and our members now on the other side of the AGM on, on kind of sharing our learnings and collaborating in ways that, that, that make sense with our members relative to their, uh, their you know, where they are in that journey, if you will. Uh, we went through an organizational effort to develop principles and values. Um, I don't know if Alexa, yeah, there you go. So this was something that we felt innately that these, you know, that we had principles and values, but they'd never been articulated in writing. So again, in a pandemic kind of introspective environment, we went through a really a staff led process, multiple interviews across the organization uh, to develop these and articulate them. And now we push them through. Uh, everything we do. So you see here, our principles are that we aim high, uh, we win together, and we champion DEI, and our values are integrity, commitment, teamwork, and respect. So now that we've articulated them, we're in the process of living them. Uh, I'll tell you one example, for example, is that we have implemented performance management in the Federation and goal setting. And right now, we're actually concluding our uh, performance review process. And one of those elements of that process is to understand or to evaluate how we're living against our principles and values. You know, these articulated principles and values, are we representing them? Are we living them on a daily basis? So this is something organization that we're very uh, proud of and want to continue to push through, uh, you know, at, at every level. Uh, the other thing that we took some time to do, this is senior leaders and myself, and we worked with uh, Cindy, and we also worked with one of our board members who headed up strategy at the NBA uh, for many years and now is a partner at Ernst & Young. And we, we sat down and really spent several months over the summer uh, trying to benchmark and put together goals for 20, 2030. So as, as we all know, our mission is to make soccer the preeminent sport in the United States. And so we really felt like we needed to have some sort of guidepost between where we are today and that ultimate vision and mission, which obviously is, is uh, very aspirational. And so we put these goals together and really the, the, the point of this was to try to identify three verticals, performance, participation, and fandom. Uh, you can see them here on the performance side. We want to maintain our women as the number one team in the world. Obviously the rest of the world is catching up. So we know that's going to be uh, something that's going to be challenging as we go forward. You know, on our men's side, currently at 22 FIFA rank, and we put the goal out there to be in the top eight. And we know that uh, if you're in consistently in that top eight in that quarterfinal range, then you have an opportunity to win it. Uh, obviously, depth comes into play. I think uh, if you ask any uh, player who's been involved in a World Cup run, particularly on our women's side, they'll tell you that luck has a lot to do with it as well to get to that final stage and, and to win the whole thing. So we want our men to be in that group that has the opportunity to make a run you know, at every at every uh, World Cup opportunity. And so that's where we came up with that top eight rank. Um, and I'll tell you in that vertical also goes high performance, uh, talent ID, uh, those things all roll into um, that particular vertical, all the things that we do to improve the environments for our players and to allow them to be the best that they can be. On the participation side, a uh, big conversation, you know, amongst ourselves. We really honed in on, on, on the youth game because we also understand if the youth game grows and is vibrant, then that will have a uh, concomitant impact on the adult game. And so if we honed our efforts into that space, which also includes obviously our members and working collectively with you all, um, you're going to ask me how we're going to get there. That's the next step. We need to work together to figure that out. Uh, but also coaching education goes into this. Our referee programs, the more refs that we have, registered and, and operating and the more coaches we have uh, who are moving up the food chain in terms of our licenses, the more they can impact uh, our, 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 our player base, if you will, our youth and adult base and, and increase the numbers who are participating. This number you'll notice is not the same as registered members, if you will, it's the broader Dick's Sporting Goods study. So it includes high schools and other 
aspects of soccer out there that to get to that seven and a half current uh, million current number. And our goal is to grow that to, to 12 million. And then you see in the uh, fandom vertical, which you think is uh, also very, very important as, as we go forward, um, you'll notice the different metrics that we have uh, in place, um, you know, there. And so in terms of those metrics, you know, obviously we have uh, our fan base, which we would like to grow uh, fairly significantly uh, up to 120 million. That 120 million number is more or less in the range of the major sports in the U.S. I think the NFL is pushing 200 million uh, NBA is in that 180 million range. So we want to get up into that range where uh, the, the more predominant uh, leagues and sports are right now. Uh, the other metric we have in there is our social media followers. Obviously, we know that social media has a big influence on folks at 84 million includes our own platforms, but in our sort of our key athletes who are out there, we want to grow that to 200 million. Uh, our viewership is very important. Currently 730 3,000 average between a men's and women's game. In terms of audience, we want to grow that to 2.5 million. I'll, I'll tell you anecdotally, the women's game against Brazil uh, the other week actually delivered a combined audience across English and Spanish language of 745,000 for that one broadcast. So uh, that was a uh, you know, really positive occurrence and we're, we want to see that trend continue on a regular basis. And we're also being very cognizant of the fact that viewing habits are changing. You know, we've seen that all of us through the pandemic, there's much more direct to consumer type viewing habits happening. Um, and we want to be cognizant of that change and be able to adapt accordingly. And then we have a very ambitious goal in our database of growing from 1.3 million to 30 million. Um, and we need to figure out how to get there as well. And so in that regard, what that means are people that we can communicate with directly. It's predominantly driven right now through uh, folks who buy tickets or who are insiders that we have really good data on that we can communicate with. And we really want to push that to a much broader engagement level to that 30 million uh, level by 2030 to help us drive fan engagement, drive interest in the sport and drive the growth of our sport. So that's uh, something I just wanted to share with you. I know I've mentioned these, or we mentioned them last week through the AGM. Um, and also, uh, I also think you talked about them in my opening comments. So you've probably seen some of that, but you'll want to continue to drive that message home. Uh, obviously, as it relates to members and our, what we try to do and, and provide uh, for you guys, you know, first of all, relative to these goals, we know that there's no way we're going to get there on our own, that we're all going to have to work together to get there. Um, also, to that end, I did want to formally introduce to you all uh, Alexa Vicroy, who is our member relations manager. Um, you know, Alexa joins us most currently from FIFA. She also was a D1 soccer player at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, Alexa, do you just want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks for the introduction, Will. Um, yeah, I'm here to be your point of contact and an open line of communication to the Federation as well as a resource um, as you go grow the game um, at home. Um, my job is to understand your challenges as members, take in that feedback, collaborate and improve all the areas of the game. Um, so you can expect to see a lot of me at AGMs, uh, member meetings, webinars, coaching education, and, and referee meetings. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Alexa. So, you know, we obviously sanction competitions. You know, the Open Cup is back online. Uh, we're also, uh, youth teams are now able to, uh, to resume high-level competition against domestic and foreign teams, uh, which had been, you know, put on pause because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, growth and development, the educational resources, uh, that we can put together, member resources, coach and ref licensing, uh, instructor development. You know, we're going to continue to build on this infrastructure to just support the broader development of the game. Uh, and as a result of that, the tools and technology that we uh, put in place to support that will also support, you know, the participant experience and improve the administrative processes and try to find efficiencies that, uh, that support the ecosystem in that regard. And then sharing that data, you know, and coordinating research uh, to better understand the areas of need, if you will, and the areas of opportunity across our broad uh, membership base. Uh, and then obviously Innovate to Grow, and which cur currently, as you know, is, is, uh, is, is targeted towards COVID support. You know, from a governance perspective, uh, legal, uh, administrative guidance and support, you know, safe sport is a very, very important part of our ecosystem right now, as I know you all uh, are very aware of. So our ability to offer tools to, to manage that, to track and manage 
uh, compliance, you know, the broader appeals and, and grievance process. Uh, those are all things that we that we oversee and manage. Um, and I, you know, and also, you know, we're we're a you know we're a member, if you if you will, of FIFA and CONCACAF and the USOPC. So we're entrusted to oversee soccer uh, and its uh, development domestically in this in this country as a result of those affiliations. Um, and the other, uh, I think, area that we also offer support and that you guys are aware of is international games. You know, when we come into markets, uh, obviously there is a revenue that's generated for the states uh, for those games that take place uh, in, in your particular uh, market. And then I think, you know, finally the brand, you know, the national teams. It's obviously aspirational for all of our youth across the landscape to want to try to make it to uh, our youth national teams and on to the senior national team and our ability to field competitive teams uh, at the highest level, you know, has a huge impact on uh, the ecosystem and on the, per the perception of soccer, if you will, and making that a, a sport of choice. So that's something that we think about a lot and spend a lot of time, uh, uh, you know, thinking through. You know, as we look ahead, you can see here on the slide, obviously there's a number of uh, big events coming up, you know, spearheaded quite frankly by World Cup in 2026. It's obviously seems far away, but it's not. And that's an area I think uh, for me, as we come out of this first year, it's been very sort of introspective. I think that you'll see from the Federation uh, more of an external approach. Certainly uh, meeting with you all today is, is something that I'm very happy to do and I'm glad to do. And, and I'd like to replicate across the, the broader membership base. I think it's time for us and for me to start reaching out and, and communicating and collaborating with all of you all to help us uh, achieve where we wanna go. Uh, and then the World Cup is, is a huge moment for us. And, you know, we're looking at a run here in this country like we've never seen with 2026. Obviously, we have to qualify for 2022 on the men's side. Uh, we have the Olympics coming up this summer, uh, Tournament of Nations, you know, the w Women's World Cup in 2023 in Australia and New Zealand. But then we have this run of events domestically with the, the Men's World Cup in 2026 and then the Olympics, the LA Olympics in 2028. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully one day we can look at uh, bidding on a future Women's World Cup in our geography. So there's, there could be a, a run of 10 years, if you will, of like we've never seen in this country of, of high profile events, you know, on our doorstep, uh, in our backyards that we can work through leverage to benefit uh, the broader uh, sport of, of soccer. So, um, you know, that's what I would kind of leave you with. Obviously, we just came out of you know, our She Believes Cup, um, you know, that was very, very successful. The engagement levels on that were, uh, uh, were, were through the charts or off the charts, if you will. Um, and we're really proud of that platform that's grown over the last five or six years. Uh, it's something that we want to continue to grow and then also look at other platforms that we can develop that will have the same sort of uh, impact, um, if you will, on, on what we're trying to do and growing fan engagement and, and providing opportunities for our national teams to shine and for our membership to, to look towards. So I think that's where I'll leave it. You know, hopefully that wasn't too much information. Um, I am looking at the clock here and I, I do have to run here fairly shortly, so I apologize. Uh, but if there's a couple of questions, I'm happy to take them. Mark, um, I, I have a couple of things, if you don't mind. Uh, well, hey, thank you for coming on. My name is Brad Roos, and uh, I've been with uh, youth soccer for about 30 years here in the state of Maryland. So first of all, I have to say that um, the putting a lot more emphasis on the recreational soccer, which it seems has been something that Maryland and uh, other national organizations have done, is a really good a positive development. I think our development process starts from the bottom up, and the fact that or putting more emphasis on that part of the soccer landscape is good. I was just wondering though, if you could speak for a second about the competitive pyramid. Um, it just seems like in the competitive side of youth soccer, it seems very fractured. There seems to be a lot of cannibalization between uh, of teams and clubs between the different organizations that are part of youth soccer, which has helped, I think, has destabilized the youth soccer model as far as a competitive part of it. Have you guys thought about or what action items do you think could be done to get the organizations with the competitive landscape and youth soccer working together to better serve and develop players in the United States? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think we have a lot of work to do there and I'm not gonna uh, tell you I have a, a 
you know, a, a detailed plan of how to address it because that would be insincere. I will tell you that just last earlier this week, I went through uh, with our sporting department uh, a, a very detailed um, assessment of the of the landscape right now in terms of where we are on the competitive side and you know where uh, you know the various tournaments that are happening and platforms and you know how we're looking at scouting and recruiting those and talent ID throughout those and uh, you know how they're headed and what you know what stage of development they're in or they're not in and so there's there's a lot there to process. Um, you know, I think the the effort for is really going to have to be collaborative, and we're going to have to find a way to to uh, you know find ways to work together, not only to support the platforms that exist, but to grow the game. You know, I, I think that we need to find ways to put our arms around more players in the country and bring them into the fold, as opposed to uh, trying to find ways to you know to move players around that already exist, if that makes sense. So. Uh, I'm probably not answering your question directly, but it is something that we're we are thinking about, and something that we we know that we have to address. Okay, well, thanks. Well, one more question, if anybody has, before Will has to go back to work. No, we have one. Hold on here. It's it, Will. Congratulations. From a communications and social media standpoint. What areas are you looking for U.S. soccer to grow in the lead up in the lead up to the World Cup 2026? Uh, great question. Um, I will tell you, and I think I kind of alluded to it. World Cup is going to be a real focus for me, as you know, really starting now that we're we're on the five year run, um, and our broader communications platforms and and how we look at how we communicate. Uh, the areas that we need to approach on, it's going to have to have a specific vertical for World Cup alone. You know, we're going to have to build out a, a process of how we're going to message uh, what's coming to this geography, how we develop assets, if you will, that we can that we can deliver uh, to members to support that messaging, and how we all are all kind of on the same page about how we're trying to uh, to you know welcome, if you will, the world into. Uh, our country and our, our region, actually, because as you know, obviously, uh, Canada and Mexico are part of this as well. So we will be developing and building out a very specific World Cup communication strategy. Um, and we will look forward to obviously sharing that with you guys as we go. Okay, that was the last question because Will has to go once again. Will and Alexa, we really appreciate you guys coming on. Alexa, you could stay if you want to hang out with us. <laughs> but uh, again, Marilyn is so proud and happy that you guys took the time today from the Federation to join Marilyn and DC and give us some updates on what's happening, especially the exciting 2026. So thanks again. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to take you up on that offer to come back online with us again sometime. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Will and Alexa. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Um, I'm, very happy that, and excited that you know Will was able to join us. It's just a nice, it's a, just a nice offering from the Federation. But we even have more important news to talk to you about today. This young man on your screen right now is having a birthday today. It's it's Greg Smith's birthday, and I wanted to wish him an extraordinary, special birthday. Marilyn is very excited to have you back home with us. You've done more in six weeks than I, I can't imagine. Uh, in fact, you're making me run, run. You're, you're making me work hard for my money because you're, you're fast and you're working diligently and you're not giving up and you're thinking way outside the box. So Marilyn and DC wish you a wonderful and happy birthday, Greg. Uh, thanks, Mark. This is the downside of social media. You don't tell anyone, but it pops up. Hey, remember, it's Greg's birthday today. So it's all good. It's so great to see everyone. And uh, it was really nice to have Will on. I think we're the first state association in the entire country uh, to have him come on and actually engage a little bit uh, with the membership. Like he said, because of COVID, he's, he's kind of been uh, locked in, in his home for a while. And hasn't really been in a position to, to start doing these things. So <clears throat> thank you to Mark for uh, coming up with the idea and for asking Will and, and for making sure that this happened. It's really great. We always like to start with just a reminder of who we are, why we're here, and what we're all trying to do together. So 
Our mission at MSYSA is to grow the game. We do that in working collaboratively with our incredible affiliate clubs and leagues. We do that through educating, supporting, promoting, and providing. Uh, today, we actually want to talk about a couple items that you see within the support uh, pillar, if you will, and those would be grants and scholarships. But before we get off this slide, uh, you can see on the screen there, if you're not currently doing so, please do follow us on our social channels. We believe in connecting, we believe in engaging, and we are confident <clears throat> that by doing those things together, we are all going to grow. So if you're not doing so already, please do encourage all of your coaches and parents and players to do the same. Uh, we are one team, one nation, like you saw on that sign on that last slide, but even more so, we're one family. So please, please do uh, get on and, and follow us. <clears throat> we, as an organization, uh, the board of directors led by Mark Cantor as president, decided that in uh, light of this being the 45th anniversary, uh, they committed to the organization investing tens of thousands of dollars, it's $45,000 to be precise, to be given out through grants and scholarships throughout the remainder of this year, specifically designed to increase opportunities for participation to therefore grow the game of soccer within Maryland and DC. And uh, what we're gonna just talk about here briefly today is that those grants and scholarships are coming online on Monday, March the 8th. So it's literally like two and a half days from now, three days from now. So the first one that you see on your slide here are these presidential scholarships. These really are geared towards individuals. So whether they are players, coaches, administrators, referees, uh, we are looking to allocate funds for people in those categories that maybe they have a financial uh, barrier in place right now to pursue that next coaching education license, for example. Or maybe as a player, <clears throat> there's an opportunity to go to a camp or to go receive training or uh, whatever it might be, uh, equipment needs. And they say, man, I could really benefit if you would be willing to help cover these costs, for example. The scholarship is here, is in place to help with all of those examples and many, many more. <clears throat> we purposely created this to not be uh, so restrictive that we maybe weren't able to foresee all the different ways uh, that money could help with increasing participation increasing opportunities and growing the game. So the way this is going to work is for the presidential scholarships, these are being offered on what we call a rolling basis. So they do technically go live on Monday, March 8th, but they will continue to be offered on an ongoing basis until all of the allocated money is, has already you know, been given out or uh, we reach the end of the year. But I'm pretty sure uh, the former will come before the latter. So on Monday, we will be putting out a press release We'll be announcing this on our social channels as well. Uh, it is an online application. It's really simple uh, that the individual requesting uh, to be receiving a scholarship will fill it out and they'll hit submit. And every two or three weeks, all of the applications that have come in for scholarships during that time will be initially reviewed uh, here in the office. And then they will all go to a committee, a small group uh, that has been put in place it's chaired by Trish Heffelfinger, who's going to speak in just a moment. Uh, and that group will make the final decisions as far as awards uh, of monies being uh, given to the different individuals who, who are requesting for those scholarships. So again, the only real restrictions, if you will, is that it really needs to be uh, the, the purpose, the reason why you're asking, really needs to be to increase opportunities for participation, to increase your opportunities to continue uh, growing the game, either yourself because you're playing or helping others to grow the game. Like if you're a coach, for example, pursuing education or a referee pursuing uh, your recertifications uh, and on and on and on. And uh, so you do need to be a registered individual with MSYSA or the State Youth Referee uh, Assigner, for example, and you need to be in good standing, uh, which I believe most everyone is. The last little piece, because we're really, really focusing on this and committed to it, you also need to be following MSYSA on our social channels, um, because we do believe that is a medium uh, that can be very powerful in trying to stay connected and trying to engage with people, and we're committed to, to growing those counts uh, on those channels. So again, um, I'm going to switch over and talk about the grants, but if you have any questions that uh, are coming to mind, just, just sit on those for one moment as we go through the grants, they're very similar um, as, uh, as the scholarships, but these MSYSA affiliate grants 
truly are geared towards the affiliate clubs and leagues uh, who uh, choose to, to be with the Maryland State Youth Soccer Association in both Maryland and DC. And again, same idea, the, the monies that will be awarded should be going to help increase opportunities for kids to play the game and should be going to help reduce the cost of offering possibly programs that already exist. For example, uh, the way that an affiliate would go about applying uh, for these grants is very similar uh, to the scholarships in that uh, on Monday, March 8th, it will be opened up. The window will stay open from March 8th through April 16th, at which time the application window will close. At that time, all the applications that have been received will be reviewed uh, first internally and then ultimately by uh, the committee that I referenced a moment ago to make all final determinations for grant monies being awarded. And all of the awards, all of the individual clubs and leagues receiving grants will be notified no later than June 1st. Because of where this falls in the overall cycle of soccer uh, here within our jurisdiction, affiliates will be able to choose if they want to use those award monies, those grant monies within the current seasonal year, which is at that point would be almost over, or if they would like to defer and use those monies in the coming uh, seasonal year. Um, so again, same, same concept for an affiliate to be eligible, they have to be a member and they have to be in good standing and they also need to be following MSY State on the social uh, channels. So um, if there are any questions, uh, we can take those now. Uh, and we also uh, are gonna pause for a minute uh, for the chair of the Grant and Scholarship Committee, our own Trish Heffelfinger uh, to, to have her share a few words as well. So Trish. Thanks, Greg. Um, first of all, I wanna say that this has been an initiative that Mark Cantor has really championed um, and that I feel very passionate about. And I'm really proud that MSYSA has made the commitment. Um, I'm looking forward to providing opportunities for either kids or affiliates to remove any kind of barriers, financial barriers, and help them to grow the game and grow participation in Maryland. Um, if there's anyone out there that would like to be on my small committee, um, there are probably going to be three of us, um, please email me um, and um, I'd love to uh, talk to you about it. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to do something really good for players and affiliates in the state of Maryland. So thanks very much. Are there any questions before we move on? Okay, so again, monitor your inbox as well out by mass email, press release, and also across our social channels. On Monday, everything will launch and we certainly look forward to receiving those and helping as many people as we can to as much extent as we can to continue growing the game. Uh, so thank you, Mark. Thanks, that was a great uh, uh, few minutes. I enjoyed hearing about these because it's really, as I was listening to both Trish and Greg speak, it really was a dream that we had uh, a few years ago and we talked about it and talked about it. Implementation is, is the key word because we're finally doing things and it's really exciting to, to be a doer for once. So I really appreciate everyone, Trish and the whole staff and everyone to help put this together and help move it forward because uh, it's progress for the state. Even, even during COVID, we are determined to be better because if we're better, then our affiliates are better because that's how, that's how it works. So anyway, uh, the next update will be our um, state cup director who unfortunately has been struggling with COVID and fields for you know the past couple months, but he, he is uh, committed to get this done and he's doing a great job for us. And that's Brad Roos, our Cups director. Thanks, Mark, and I hope everybody's having a great day. It's great to see people back on the call. Um, and just to clear that up, I actually have not had COVID yet. Um, so I, wanna, I wanted to clear that up. We have had issues with restrictions on having fields and games and the weather has, has been, but 
Uh, on a positive part, we did have 10 cup games played last weekend. We are have, we do have a couple this weekend. And then starting the weekend of March 13th and 14th, we start really ramping up. <coughs> um, on the, the positive side, we are playing uh, matches in all counties with the exception of Montgomery, which we still have not gotten a, a firm resolution on moving forward there, unfortunately. And uh, Prince George's County is still requiring masks. And so I'm, I'm doing everything I can to try to avoid matches in, in uh, counties or jurisdictions where players have to wear masks. The reason for that is quite honestly, is it may be, uh, it may be something that occurs in, in your league games in order for you to have um, home matches. But for the cup, because it's so important and because it is an elimination uh, situation, I'm really trying to avoid the fact that both players and referees um, would have to would have to uh, have masks on the field because it is a deterrent to providing oxygen for the players and for the referees when they're participating. Um, just a note that in the 15U through 18 slash 19U in State Cup and President's Cup, those matches are being scheduled by the two teams. And basically the procedure is the two teams communicate with each other. I've sent out all the contact information uh, to those divisions. They communicate with each other. They decide on a date a time and hopefully a location where that match can be played. Um, if they can't find a location for the match, then I uh, would then secure a, a location for that. They then email me that information. I then make sure that we get referees assigned for that. In the 12 through 14, those matches do not start for the majority until April. I will, I will schedule those matches on the weekends that we have on the calendar online. If you have any scheduling considerations that need to be accommodated, there is a link on both the State Cup and the President's Cup website that they need to go on and fill out and then I will work around those conflicts. Please remember again that when we get to April and I start scheduling the matches, that Sunday is the default day. So what do I mean by that? That means that if one team is asked for a Saturday game and the other team is asked for a Sunday game, the game will be played on Sunday. So my suggestion to you, if you're looking to schedule league games in April, May, and June, that I would schedule your league games on Saturday, I would then put in a schedule consideration to put your cup match on Sunday, and then you're guaranteed that's what, what, what it will be since Sunday is the default, is the default day. There are two matches in the 14U boys that do have play-in games that are going to have to be played in March. That's the Matrix Maestros versus FC Frederick and Next Level Ajax White versus Brasa Blue. Those two matches are going to have to be scheduled between the two teams uh, in March. And so I have not heard back from either one of those, but I will be reaching out to them to get those matches scheduled. Um, other than that, that's really the update I have. Is there any questions or any um, uh, anything that anyone needs me to clear up for them as far as the cup competitions? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next update. Thank you. Next. We have our dedicated director of coaching, Alan Lydiate, is going to give us some updates on uh, coaching education. Alan? I think this is Alan's time to take a nap, maybe. <laughs> All right, so Alan, maybe you're on mute. Move to the next slide, please. Okay, long-term, dedicated, always first one to raise his hand to help out the state of Maryland for anything. This guy has is, is been the, our go-to guy for years and years. He's, uh, he's pretty, pretty much respected not only in the state of Maryland, 
but all over the uh, uh, region one and essentially all over the country. He's, he's known to be uh, uh, someone who, who will never let you down, even though he doesn't have any knees left. But regardless, I'd like to introduce uh, our Central East Commissioner and President, Regional President, Regional Cup President, Sean Fleming. Thank you, Mark. Um, just make sure that I'm not on mute. Right. No, you're not. We hear you. Okay. So I just want to give everybody a quick update on the MSYSA recruitment policy. Uh, please remember that the goal of the policy is to provide a level field of competition between our affiliate members in the pursuit of recruiting players, coaches, and teams. As you know, we've instituted a window where coaches may actively pursue players to come join their team. The window is called the open recruitment period and it runs from May 15th through June 30th. Outside of that window, if a coach or club official wants to recruit a player from another club, they must first contact the leadership of that other club to gain permission to approach the player. If the coach doesn't receive the permission, then the coach should not contact a player until the next open recruitment period. So uh, now the meat of the, the policy is what happens outside of that open recruitment window. Um, we've gone through three cases so far, and based upon those cases, we're making some improvements to the policy. Uh, the four main improvements that I'll go over here are first, speeding up the process. We know that uh, the first few cases have been lengthy in time and uh, COVID had a big impact on that. So what we're trying to do is establishing set timelines on the certain steps that, that are under our control. Um, for example, from the time we, re we receive an official complaint, that complaint will be assigned to one of our three investigators with, within three calendar days. Uh, I should point out that all of our investigators are former FBI agents and are well qualified in performing the investigation. Uh, the only part that we really don't have control in setting the timeline is the actual investigation itself, because the investigator will go uh, down the path uh, based upon the answers that he, uh, he receives from, from uh, the people he, he talks to. The second improvement is setting guidelines on how we track repeat offenders. Fortunately, we haven't had any re repeat offenders and we hope that we never will. Uh, this is important uh, because our fine structure uh, increases uh, if, if you have a repeat offense. Uh, with that. The third improvement is having the MSPSA Recruitment Committee uh, review the investigator's report and determine the outcome. The recruitment committee is made up of board members. And uh, the reason we want to do this is currently the cases are reviewed by the MSYSA adjudication committee. If a club wants to appeal, they have to go to the U.S. Soccer Federation for that appeal. And that could be a very lengthy uh, time for that to happen. By having the recruitment committee uh, make that determination, then the next level of, of appeal will be the MSY Adjudication Committee. And we feel that that is uh, more to the benefit uh, and equality uh, for, for our member clubs. Lastly, uh, we're gonna be updating the MSYSA website with the recruitment policy information. We want to, want to make it more easily accessible for everyone to, to see, uh, not only for the club leadership, but also the coaches. Uh, because in the end result, we want to make sure that people don't violate the, uh, the recruitment policies that we have out there. Um, and I, I should also remind all the leadership that if you do have uh, a touchy issue here, it's best that the club presidents talk to each other uh, to see if they can iron out the, uh, the differences there before filing the complaint. Um, that's all that I have for now. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay. okay, with no questions for uh, Sean and the recruiting uh, policy, we can move on to questions. Anybody have any questions or comments we'd like to chat about now? Okay, then we'll move on. 
Um, we will announce our next webinar probably in a week or so and let you guys know when we're going to do it and uh, who would be that lucky guest that we're going to have. Uh, like in the past, if anybody has any recommendations, any contacts, any uh, anyone that you know might might be of interest to uh, all of you, it would be great to help us. We're we're struggling to find um, you know uh, guests every once in a while. We get lucky like today, and uh, um, we you know we had a a pretty impressive guest on today and. Uh, it's really good because not only did it was it good to hear from him, but it's good that he's now connected to Maryland. He knows Maryland. We're the first state to reach out to him, and that's that's pretty impressive. And uh, I think he enjoyed his time with us, and I and I have a feeling he'll be back again. So, any other comments or anything? Okay, hearing none, we'll we'll sign off for today. There is a chat. Hold on. Let's see here. Oh, Alan had to get off on a coaching ed webinar with U.S. Soccer. So that's where that happened. Well, thank you, Keith, for alerting us. Um, anyway, anybody have any other like uh, uh, minimal chat? Any, any other any other things uh, that anyone want to bring up? If not, it does sound like most counties are lightening up a little bit and allowing us uh, as players and coaches and clubs and associations to get back on the field with with um, uh, larger percentages now, except for the except for the two counties that were, were mentioned earlier. Uh, there's no uh, shock there. Uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, in two to three weeks when we have our next webinar. Like I said previously, it seems to me that before we know it. I'm hoping that COVID is going to be in our rear view mirror. Restaurants are opening up. You know, a lot of the restaurants have gone from 25 to 50%, except for Montgomery County. Uh, but uh, it, look, it does appear with vaccination and a lot of other things that the numbers are going in the right direction. So we're very optimistic that, that by, uh, by uh, regional time for State Cup, which is uh, June, in June, I believe, we should be good to go. So um, again, happy birthday to Greg Smith. I hope it's a good one in the office today. I know you're getting a lot done and I appreciate everybody for taking their time to come on for an hour or so and participate with us. I still uh, uh, love the connection that we have now that we form between the diff our different friends across the state and, and in DC. We actually had a nice webinar last night with our DC affiliates and uh, some of them may be on right now, I'm not sure, but it's a good way for all of us to connect, to get information and to, uh, and to hear uh, you know, some good information from time to time. So with that, have a good weekend and we'll see you in a couple weeks.